and welcome. Um, John could not be here uh, to open the meeting today. And so, uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, give you all his regards. Uh, we have a great meeting led by Roberto Gill uh, on anisotropic interactions. And I counted this is our 37th round table workshop in three, we've been going about three years. And um, so, uh, and interestingly, our first research Roundtable workshop was also about anisotropic interactions. I, it, to me, it's a great subject. So uh, next, I'd like to hand things over to Krish, who will talk about uh, upcoming meetings uh, and, of course, our EN, upcoming ENC meeting next month on April 15th. Thanks, Dave. Um, welcome, everyone. We are excited to talk about the Ivan NMR user group meeting, um, April 15th, Saturday before the ENC. We have a very um, uh, interesting set of uh, speakers. As usual, um, other, like other Ivan meetings, this is going to be both, uh, this will be telecast via Zoom and our YouTube channel. Um, so it is more, it's a hybrid meeting. There'll be attendees and speakers in person at SLOMAR, as well as um, um, remotely from uh, using uh, Zoom. Um, as um, you might have received notifications, if not, uh, you should be receiving soon, or you can visit our website. Um, the agenda looks pretty good. We also will have an um, uh, 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 announcement on next. Um, Founders Award winner. In addition to that, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at the Ivan MR Resources Q1 booth, we will have in the evening, we will have an Ivan Hour. This is more of a lighter side of things. Um, all three days uh, at different times, probably. Uh, but um, look forward to that in the email or look in our website and register. Even if you are not attending, uh, if you are not coming to SLOMR um, for ENC. With that, I will stop this one. And I also want to talk about upcoming meetings um, in the Ivan workshop. The next workshop um, is in May. Uh, the date is yet to be finalized. Uh, this will be on water suppression. Uh, it will be led by Gennady Kirish and Misha from Merck team. And, and then we have a couple of more that we are at this time working on uh, finalizing. So the workshop continues on a monthly basis, except um, April, when we are going to take a break and do a, a bigger conference at EMC. Um, with that, I will pass it back to Dave for kickstart this meeting. Okay, great. Thanks, Krish. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the Ivan hours. Um, the, uh, our first one, we have Ron Crouch back by popular demand uh, talking about the stars. And the, uh, our second one is Clemens Anklin uh, talking about the Tamu newsletter. And then our third one, which will actually be seven o'clock rather than eight o'clock is about art from our friend Nick Zumbalitis um, talking about uh, using NMR in art restoration. So I think that we got a lot of interesting topics for the Ivan hours. I hope people will be there for them. So anyway, I'll hand things over to Roberto and you can get started. Thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Chris. And um, uh, I just realized that we we organized the first meeting on NMI and isotropic media, the first Ivan. I was chair at that time and now they came here. So we are going to talk uh, about the anisotropic interaction. Now the, 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 the world of NMI and isotropic media brought them from RDCs to RQCs, residual quadrupolar couplings and residual chemical shift and isotropy. Um, today, uh, the roundtable panelists are Han Soon from the Leibniz Research Institute for Molecular Pharmacology in Berlin, Germany. Thomas Williamson from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington in North Carolina. 
and Philippe Leso from the University of Paris, Saclay, or say France. Um, first, you know, here, you know, everybody knows this, you know, we've been using anisotropic NMR parameters for years, chemical shift, nuclear overhouse effect or enhancement NOE, a scalar coupling. Okay, if you don't understand what is this about, probably you sign up for the wrong webinar. Um, so what are anisotropic NMR parameters? Uh, anisotropic NMR parameters, they are parameters whose value depends on the orientation of the molecule respect to the magnetic field, because the other conventional NMR, NMR parameters are independent or orientation, but anisotropic NMR parameters are dependent. And, th and they are. The first one, normally the, the most popular was the dipolar coupling. That, but the dipolar coupling vanished in isotropic solution because the internuclear vectors, for example, CH bonds, adopt all the possible orientations with respect to the magnetic field with the same probability, you know, the orientation. So that's what we call isotropic tumbling. But in the presence of an anisotropic medium, a fraction of this value is observed 10 to the negative three, 10 to the negative four, which is non-residual because it's a residual value, residual dipolar coupling. If there is a J involved between these two spins that also are dipolarly coupled, the signal is observed as the total coupling. And the total coupling is equal to the J plus the RDC. And RDCs can be positive, negative, or new. Then we have a chemical shift uh, that is another anisotropic NMR parameter. Uh, and it is isotropic in, in, in isotropic solutions, sorry. It is observed as the average value of the three components of the chemical shift tensor. But in the presence of an anisotropic medium, the average value is shifted. And this shift is known as a residual chemical shift anisotropy. Same as RDCs, RCSAs can be positive, negative, or null. And the quadrupolar coupling that is an interaction between the electric field gradient you know, of the bond and the quadrupolar moment uh, of, of, the, of the, the quadrupolar nuclei, like, like for example, deuterium or lithium, um, vanishes in isotropic solution for the same reasons explained for the dipolar coupling above. In the presence of an anisotropic medium, a fraction of it is observed same way as the RDCs, and it is known as the residual quadrupolar coupling. The scalar coupling has an anisotropic component, but it is not as strong as for the three previous parameters. So for example, fluorine shows some, but it's, it, it's not practical to use because it's very small. Um, what is the structural value of anisotropic NMR parameters? Well, they encode valuable 3D structural information. The information is of non-local character and correlates the relative orientation of stereogenic centers regardless of the distance between them in the molecule. That's the most powerful part because NOE and J couplings give you information of local character, but when you want to correlate stereogenic centers that are disconnected by NOE or J coupling, you can connect them by using an isotropic NMR parameter. Well, this is the dipolar coupling. You have seen this in many talks. You know, it's a direct interaction between the, um, the two spins, like two magnets, but the residual dipolar coupling provides information of the relative orientation of internuclear vectors in the molecule. For example, CH, NH, CF, CP bonds, or non-bonded. It can be non-bonded, proton-proton, or carbon-carbon pairs, et cetera. They are easy to measure. The limitations are, for example, proton deficient molecules, because the most popular is the carbon proton. And if there are no protons, then you don't have the chance to measure, for example, the one bond. Um, the residual chemical shift anisotropy provides the relative orientation of the chemical shift tensors in the molecule, orientation that depends on molecular configuration. 
they can be measured for any type of carbons, even quaternary, provided that the carbon show enough anisotropy. We have to be very careful here because when we say that we can see quaternary carbon, is that quaternary carbon doesn't have a very anisotropic chemical shift tensor, you won't really get much information out of it. And it is useful for proton deficient molecule where you don't have enough CH vectors. Is ideal for molecules containing, you know, sp2 carbons, aromatic rings, double bonds, and carbonyls. For example, just to give just a simple example, here in the in the determination of the solution of strong with ap strong, you can see here the relative orientation of the chemical shift tensor of the aromatic ring and the carbonyl, and that is enough in order to see the relative orientation. So the relative orientation gives you the correct configuration, and the residual quadrupolar coupling, Philippe Lesso, who is the expert in this topic, will provide more details. But we, for example, he, we use the 1D2H NMR spectrum of the deuterated solvent peak, for example, to verify if the sample is anisotropic. The degree of anisotropy by looking at the value of the quadrupolar, the 2H solvent signal, for example, and the quality of the anisotropy by looking at the, say, at the shape of the solvent signal. Um, I just want to mention quickly, I didn't do much lately, but um, we recently published a cross-link poly for acrylomorpholine. You know, this is a, it's a flexible gel. It is uh, it's, it's water compatible, and, and we use this to analyze um, a peptide, a cyclic peptide and a small molecule with Kathleen Farley from Pfizer. Martin Kuss was my postdoc, but now he's working for Pfizer, and Leandro Gil Silva, who makes the the gels. This is just the gel is a cross link acrylomorpholine with meta, meta, methyl metacrylate. It's a copolymer, but the MMA is just added for robustness. It doesn't change the properties. Here is just the synthesis. Uh, we use uh, the stringing hydrochloride. It's very powerful to probably analyze uh, um, alkaloid salts. And we also analyze that peptide. In the case of uh, strychnine, we collected 16 RDCs. And um, in the gel, we got a Q factor of 0 0.08 compared to strychnine was 0 0.04. And we found out that there is the, the, the alignment is modulated by binding. So the, we have a strong alignment and also the alignment is ro rotated respect to what we uh, normally observe. And here is just the conformational analysis of this cyclic peptide. And we found 62% of this main conformer and 38%. The major conformation matches previous NOE structure. A minor conformation was not described before. And for you guys, what I did is I prepare material. So I'm not gonna go over that, but you will find in my presentation, a lot of material here. I put together, I compile everything from almost every author, and then you will be able to, to see that during my, um, during the, the recording. Okay, so uh, now I think that, um, say this, our next speaker is gonna be Philippe Lesso. So Philippe, you're up. Oh, one more thing. I would like, let's, let's leave the questions, uh, for after the three speakers finish their talk, we will have a big discussion at the end. Well, so thank you, Roberto, for this introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer to, for the opportunity to present some recent work during this new even meeting dedicated to the analysis of a small molecule in oriented uh, solvents. My uh, talk uh, will be mainly focused on the use of deuterium NMR in chiral oriented system, such as PBLG. And in particular, I will show you three interesting results recently published in, uh, by our group uh, located at the uh, University of Paris-Saclay in France at Orsay. And the result, this result cover three important aspects of the anisotropic deuterium NMR spectroscopy. Well, uh, in an oriented solvent, uh, NMR in oriented solvent is a powerful and versatile approach to obtain crucial information for various application, uh, analytical application. And we can mention the chiral or prochiral analysis 
and uh, the determination of the relative configuration and also the investigation of the interaction between a solute and uh, a polymer and um, the mesophase. Uh, this is possible because uh, uh, in oriented media, we have access to the uh, uh, RCSA, RQC, and uh, RDC. RQC is for nuclei with a spin i over one half. Um, to uh, extract the molecular information from anisotropic NMR uh, spectra or NMR interaction in the best condition, we can play on three parameters. The choice of the nuclear spy to record the data wanted, the type of uh, NMR experiments, and the way to proceed for the collection of data, and uh, of course, uh, the uh, choice of the most suitable and efficient mesophase for recording NMR spectra, lyotropic system, gel, and so on. So in this uh, first uh, part, uh, the first game that we propose today is to play with a new anisotropic deuterium NMR experiment. And this uh, job is made in our group, uh, led by uh, Boris, which is an expert of ultra-fast NMR experiments. Well, um, Deuterium atoms are very exciting nuclei because among codipolar nuclei, you have a spin equal to one and a small nuclear codipolar moment Q leading to a rather long T1 relaxation time for deuterium and subsequently leading to high resolution NMR spectra. As a second type of, uh, a second, second isotope of hydrogen, they are naturally present in all organic uh, molecules. From the uh, anisotropic viewpoint uh, for deuterium, we observe, we observe for a single deuteron, a quadrupolar doublet, with a splitting variant between zero and one kilohertz for, P, uh, for PBLG sample, for instance. Um, and uh, the quadrupolar splitting are generally smaller uh, in gels below 100 hertz. And in a chiral uh, liquid crystal, it is expected to observe two quadrupolar doublets if the enantiomer are discriminated, and we can see here, they are central more or less on the same chemical shift. Well, even the relative abundance of deuterium is low, 1.5, 10 minus percent at the abundance level, natural abundance level, we can use a standard equipment such as a, a 400 megahertz magnet and a selective classical probe. Of course, the sensitivity of NID experiment is greatly improved by recorded spectra with high field NMR. And uh, if better, is, uh, the, the, the instrument is equipped with a deuterium cryogenic probe as we have in our group. And uh, we can detect uh, the uh, uh, all monodeterated isotopromer, distero or enantio isotopromer in a mixture of a molecule. And so deuterium, uh, 1D deuterium uh, spectra become uh, quickly complex to analyze. So we, to overcome this problem, we have developed several 2D experiments named COSI for quadruple order spectroscopy for simplifying the spectral analysis and assign the quadrupolar doublet. Well, recording anisotropic NID, natural abundant deuterium uh, NMR uh, 2D or 3D experiment is clearly time consuming. So we can reduce the experiment time. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. And uh, in particular, if the mesophase stability is, uh, may, can evolve uh, over a long period of acquisition. So for saving time, we can uh, play, we can apply a non-uniform sampling of data in deuterium for the F1 dimension of 2D experiments. This approach uh, combined covariance or compressed sensing uh, method. In uh, another context, uh, it is uh, very useful to record deuterium spectra with a sub-second experiment type, sub-second, under one second, in particular for reaction monitoring in real time. Here's an example of uh, reaction monitoring in a DNA mesophase. And you can see the evolution of deuterium spectra. This, uh, uh, to the uh, NMR experiment for reaction monitoring can be very interesting for uh, monitoring complex 2D, uh, 2D spectra where the mixture is made of uh, fully, uh, or many deuterium or for uh, investigate cascade reaction. So uh, for saving time, we can uh, play with ultra fast approach, which has been uh, uh, developed by Fried Friedman uh, 20 years ago. 
So in few words, the ultra fast uh, NMR approach consists of replacing, replacing the evolution T1 period by uh, in the classical FT NMR experiment uh, by a spatial encoding for leaving the horizontal dimension in the ultra fast experiment. And the T2 acquisition is um, uh, replaced by an echo planar spectroscopy imaging called EPSI uh, and giving the vertical dimension. The first work has been uh, uh, made in collaboration with Patrick Giraudot from the University of, uh, of uh, Nantes. And we have uh, uh, made the proof of ultra fast, uh, deuterium ultra fast using anisotropic solvent was uh, possible. Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, developed uh, in practice uh, free anisotropic uh, deuterium ultrafast sequence designed to mimic the classical deuterium sequence, such as a cozy type experiment for deuterium, the cozy reserve type experiment, and we can see we refocus the chemical shifts in the vertical dimension, and the double quantum. Uh, the Q the polar double quantum uh, experiment because spin one has a double quantum coherence. Here is a, you can see an example of a single scan deuterium recorded in less of in less of one second, and we can see all quadrupolar uh, doublet associated to this uh, pair de terratine molecule, uh, the, the the pantanol. And here we can have the, the, uh, the, the dipolar, the quadrupolar uh, doublet, which is a line along the, the main diagonal of the spectra. This, this spectrum is formally identical to the QCOSI spectra uh, that uh, can obtain a classical way after the tilting of the map. In the case of uh, Q-reserved ultrafast experiment, you can see here, the quadrupolar doublet are now symmetrically distributed with respect to the F1 equal to zero and uh, due to the refocusing of the chemical shift. In this case, we can uh, uh, symmetrize the, 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 the 2D map. And uh, furthermore, as uh, the chemical shift uh, deuterium is, re is refocused, we can reduce the spectral windows to the largest quadrupolar splitting of the molecule. In a technical way, in a technical uh, aspect, uh, this ADUF anisotropic deuterium ultra fast experiments are possible using a standard gradient unit of the spectrometer. 50 gross by centimeter is uh, per centimeter is enough, and we can use a classical probe or better a cryogenic probe to improve the sensitivity of this experiment. Um, here is an example of ultra fast uh, 2D experiment involving a double quantum coherence associated to the spin one here. And as you can be see in this example, the pair de terratic toluene, the interest of the 2D experiment is to uh, double the difference of chemical shift of the deuterium between two sites. This is, can be compared to the classical Q adduf QCOSI experiment for which we have a single coherence in F1 and F2 dimension. Well, as a final challenge, we are experimentally tested uh, if we could or not record Hadoof experiment at natural abundance level. Well, it's very academic, but it was very exciting. And to do this, we are recording the, the Hadoof spectrum of the trimethyl phenol uh, because this molecule uh, possess a high uh, number of equivalent deuterium sites for the methyl group in position two and uh, six. Experimentally, we have uh, detected uh, after 120 seconds, it's long for ultra fast, sure, uh, 58 scan because we are recording spectrum at natural abundance. Uh, we have been able to observe the signal of the dichloromethane and the two, um, the two methyl group in the ortho position compared to the phenyl moiety. So experimentally, aduf, aduf uh, experiment uh, is possible to record at natural abundance of deuterium. So it was a nice, nice result. So um, in the second part of this talk, I will discuss uh, on the, the 3D structure elucidation of natural compound using deuterium RQC extracted from anisotropic NID2D NMR spectroscopy. This work is in has been made in collaboration with Roberto and Armando uh, Navarro Vasquez, and uh, it was a, a nice uh, a nice contribution of the RQC to the uh, structural analysis. 
Well, uh, the soap matrix uh, alignments uh, of a solute encode, as said uh, previously, uh, Roberto, a geometrical information that can be used for the purpose of the molecular structure elucidation. This is because it exists an univocal mathematical relationship between the anisotropic uh, experimental data, RCSA, RDC, RQC, and the soap uh, order matrix that encodes for the molecular uh, geometry. Using uh, uh, RC RCSA, RQC, or RDC, or a combination of this uh, anisotropic observable, the principle for uh, determining the correct molecular structure and the right relative configuration is always the same. Establish a set of molecular uh, structure, modeled uh, molecular structure with various relative configuration, obtain a coherent uh, set of observable such as deuterium RQC, determine the uh, alignment tensor uh, by uh, algorithm based on the SVD method and uh, the evaluation of the quality factor of the fitting using is made using the Cornelescu uh, factor Q, the lowest uh, Q factor corresponding to the best fitting between the experimental data, the geometry, and the order and the uh, matrix or uh, sub order matrix. So here is uh, uh, the principle of the analysis uh, using deuterium RQC data. In short, we are combining the RQC data obtained from uh, anisotropic natural abundant deuterium NMR spectra and the sign of uh, the RQC is obtained from the analysis of uh, proton carbon 13 RDC. The correlation plot you hear uh, allow to simply display the difference between experimental and back calculated data from the uh, soap order matrix that has the uh, adjust variable in the program. Oops. Well, uh, in 2020, we have re re reported with Roberto and Armando the first example of relative configuration. Uh, using RQC and applied to uh, natural products. And uh, in uh, 2022, we have explored the case of Artemeter, which is an anti-malaria drug like artemisinin. But this molecule possesses eight uh, stereogenic center and 256 possible stereoisomers, but only one natural stereoisomer. Back to uh, the uh, artemisin. This uh, the analysis of this uh, molecule is made into two steps. First one, we have tested all reasonable configuration with a simple geometry, MM geometry, uh, as uh, shown here. And uh, the best result has, has been obtained for the Q factor for this uh, config, relative configuration. And in the second step, we made a, a more uh, accurate calculation considering all RQC uh, detect and measure in the natural abundance deuterium NMR spectra of artemisinin and using a DFT structure. So we have applied the same, uh, the same procedure for the analysis of uh, artemeter. And uh, for, um, for when we are exploiting the deuterium RQC extracted from anisotropic NID NMR, it's very convenient to record the spectral the, the isotropic NID spectrum and compared to the isotropic proton spectrum that we are, we are, you can see here, the proton spectrum, the deuterium spectrum, and this comparison allow a simple evaluation of the deuterium peak dispersion on NAD uh, proton decoupled NAD NID spectra. And this can be after compare with uh, the, uh, the spectra uh, of Artemeter uh, recorded in a polypeptide, in a polypeptide, the PBLG mesophase. This is the isotropic NID. This is, a, sorry, isotropic NID uh, of artemisin or of artemeter. The anisotropic NID uh, projection, the 2D map has been recorded in uh, if, uh, 15 hours, which is not so much. And we can see the nice uh, comparison between the two, uh, the projection and the F, uh, the, the 1D NMR. Uh, spectrum uh, yeah, recording in isotropic uh, solvent. In this example of artemeter recording with uh, 0.23 millimoles, 
uh, all the terated diastereoisomer are detected. So we are in hands uh, 18 RQC. So uh, using now this uh, RQC, all your QC and uh, uh, MMFF49 uh, geometry for artemisinin, we are able to obtain a Q factor very low, very good, and uh, oops, and uh, this, this very small value corresponding to the correct assignment uh, of the relative configuration and uh, the, the, this uh, relative configura configuration that we have obtained here is in full agreement with literature, but with an higher number of anisotropic observable. And we can mention the, the work of Hansen in, uh, two, uh, in 2017, uh, in which they are, uh, she, she was uh, using uh, 11 RDC. And here we are obtained the, the, the same result with higher accuracy with using uh, 18 RQC. Uh, as in the case of, uh, of the uh, strickling and artemisine, we may compare the position of the eigenvector and the inertia tensor. Uh, and we can see a strong correlation between the principal axis system that demonstrates the, that the nature of the molecular alignment of artemisine in strike nine and uh, artemeter is, uh, is mainly uh, of a steric nature. Well, unfortunately, the use of RQC for structural analysis in non solvent has been interrupting for almost half a year because uh, uh, in our magnets uh, did not survive to the move in a new building uh, from the Valley to the Plateau of Orsay and he stayed six months at the Brooker Swiss Hospital. And currently, the, the uh, magnet is now coming back and hope that a uh, new adventure of uh, for recording a natural abundance deuterium NMR experiment uh, we, we will come soon. Well, in uh, this last part, the game three, uh, I would like to present an interesting compar comparative uh, investigation uh, between two families of chiral polymer. And this work is a nice collaboration between uh, us and the wiggling group from the University of uh, Darmstadt. Um, in this work, we have uh, investigated the enantiodiscrimination discrimination of two families of chiral polymer, the valine uh, derived polyacetylene polymer, and compared to the L-glutamate derived polypeptides such as PBLG. The, the L-valine -valine derived polyacetylene is named uh, PLA. So uh, the two uh, chiral polymer is, is of different nature. Uh, the, the backbone is different, the side chain is different, and the position of the stereo, stereogenic center is not the same. So we may anticipate difference in the spatial and audio discrimination ability due to the diversity of, of possible interaction involving, involved in the audio discrimination mechanism. Generally, the description of the efficiency of a new chiral liquid crystal is reported in literature, is made of uh, with, with uh, always the same example of uh, isopinocanforol, IPC, mantol, or beta pinel. Here we have decided to adopt a new uh, approach by uh, broadening uh, the pool of examples to examine various facets of the molecular enantiomerism and enantiotopy. Here is a, a pool of deteriorated molecule that we have uh, investigated. And uh, in the first step, we, are, we have studied this chiral uh, analog made of uh, molecule where deuterium is on the stereogenic center. And the analysis of the deuterium uh, NMR result indicates that in almost all cases, the spectral enantio discrimination and the, the, the enantio differentiation capacity of PLA is much more pronounced than that of PBLG. And the best example can be seen with the case of the monodeterated butanol. As is in the case of uh, PBLG, uh, PLA is able to discriminate enantiotopic element in a prochiral molecule, CS and C2V molecule, including the case of the DMSO. So in a more case of deteriorated analyte examined in this work, so, 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 the enantio differentiating ability of uh, PLA is more important compared to the one of PBLG. 
To go further, uh, in terms of analytical potential in PLA, we have demonstrated the possibility to record deuterium at natural abundance level. And here we, I present you the case of a free methyl hexane, the simplest chiral alkane. And here again, the analysis of the result and the amplitude of the different the discrimination show a larger discrimination compared to so, those obtained with PBLJ phase in 2001, 20 years ago. Uh, we uh, finally demonstrate that the PLA phase could be also it could be also used to discriminate enantiomer on the basis of a difference of uh, carbon C13 RCSA, and the difference measure on the, the chemical shift difference the on C13 is uh, much larger than in PBLG. So here again, the PLA is very uh, interesting and very promising uh, chiral polymer used as a chiral selector. Uh, understanding the factor uh, involved in the, the molecular orientation uh, and the chiral discrimination a uh, very important task. And this can be uh, done uh, easily by evaluating the spectral enantio discrimination on a series of molecules, uh, of similar molecules, as we have uh, in this uh, in the pool of uh, examples that we have selected. Uh, a first uh, quantitative evaluation of the discrimination can be performed by uh, calculated the DOE, the differential ordering effects, which is uh, an, an evaluation of the discrimination around the stereogenic center. And uh, this uh, DOE variation can be used to compare the dissymmetry that can be related to the shape and isotropy of the molecule and uh, for a given series of molecules, as we can see here. And here you can see the difference of DOE for this molecule and this molecule and the difference of, of uh, shape and isotropy. Uh, to provide another approach to uh, evaluate the, the quantification of the discrimination consists of comparing the soap order matrix by calculating the generalized uh, beta angle or the cosinus value, the GCB value. And uh, to provide this evaluation of the enantiomeric discrimination and attempt to understand the factor involved in the chiral discrimination mechanism, we have uh, determined the soap order matrix of two enantiomers, the case of the confort, uh, dissolved in uh, four different uh, uh, chiral liquid crystal. So we have compared uh, the uh, RQC data obtained in uh, the PBLG, a PCBL, another polypeptide, and uh, compared to the two polymers of the polyacetylenic family, the PDA, the enantiomer of PLA, and the uh, LMSP, which is a new uh, polyacetylene synthesized by the Regling group. So here uh, is uh, a, an example of uh, uh, NID spectra recording with uh, an, ex in an atomic excess for the, uh, the, the, for the analytes, for the confort. This is because it's allowed to uh, have a simple uh, analysis and the assignment of the quadripolar doublet. So in the PDA, we have obtained 80% uh, uh, of the deuterium site are discriminated, while in the LMSP mesophase here, we uh, all uh, quadripolar, uh, all deuterium site are discriminated. So we have a sufficient number to, uh, of RQC with a DL assignment for each enantiomer to calculate the alignment tensor for each isomer. The calculation of the tensor was achieved with the program CONARCH Plus developed by uh, Stefan Himmel from the group of, uh, of Michael. And uh, the program is an interesting alternative of the MSP RQC program used for the first time for uh, the uh, RQC analysis in uh, 2017 with Armando. Here is a table of the key order based molecular data obtained for this uh, investigation. And the analysis of the GDO, the global de de degree of orientation, shows that the comfort is more oriented in the polypeptides than in the polyacetylene. The analysis of the GCB value shows that the comfort is more discriminated in LMSP and PCBL, and PCBL compared to the PDA and PBLG. So the results uh, show clearly that uh, 
uh, you have a complex interplay between the solute and the nature of the polymer. And the high um, dimensionality of all interaction makes the discrimination, makes the design of the global chiral descriptor able to reliably, reliably model the all recognition phenomenon is very difficult. And the prediction of the NMR uh, result remain a real a challenge. Well, just a few words to finish to show that we are, you can play with all the codipolar nuclei using oriented solvent in the frame of the structural uh, elucidation. And in particular with the lithium seven, which is a spin uh, three half. And I may, I, I may advise you to look at the work of Stalker and John and the co-workers published uh, recently uh, this year. It's a really nice paper that combines the lithium uh, seven RQC value and the proton carbon RDC data to establish the structure of a lithium complex that have a special place in modern chemistry. Well, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, uh, I would like to mention two book chapters on anisotropic NMR will be published in uh, 2031, 33, sorry. The first, first one has been uh, uh, written with Olivier Lafont from the Unité, Unité, uh, University of Lille and concerns the fast 2D NMR method. And the second uh, has been written with Roberto and uh, it was a nice uh, contribution to the NMR in oriented media. So thank you for your attention, your patience, and sorry for my for being slightly too long. Thank you. The next speaker is going to be um, Han Zoom. So Han. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Roberto for this kind introduction and also for the nice invitation. So yeah, I really enjoyed the talk from Philip uh, very much. So hearing a lot about the RQCs. So in my talk, I will mainly focus on RDC and RCSA. So here I would like to give you several examples that we have been working in the past to use this uh, anisotropic NMR parameters to determine the structure of uh, some bioactive compounds. Um, yeah, here is an overview slide showing you the molecule that we have been working in the past. So um, yeah, you can see that most of these compounds are natural products, but we have been also um, working on some um, synthetic molecule. For example, this one, this is a microaddition product where two still centers. So here they, they were unknown. And together with Amando, we have been also investigating the stereochemistry of a synthetic dimer. Um, and um, here I would like to also mention that we have been also working on a real drug molecule, which is um, mefloquine. This is a, a real, um, real drug on the market. This is uh, uh, to treat the malaria, malaria disease. And here we have been using the RDC together with the uh, chiroptical spectroscopy, where we have revisited the absolute configuration of this molecule. So from this uh, um, experiences we gather so uh, gathered from these examples. So here, um, yeah, I have concluded that this anisotropic NMR parameters could be quite kind of quite uh, useful in the following uh, four challenging cases. So the first one was already uh, mentioned by Roberto at the beginning. So if you have two stereogenic domains, they are structurally far apart. Here, the anisotropic NMR parameters, since they are long range structural parameters. They are especially very useful. And here I also want to mention that the anisotropic NMR parameters, they can be also very nicely used to define the conformational states of the structurally very flexible molecules. And uh, this is something also mentioned by Roberto. So th for the proton deficient molecules, so we have, uh, for example, the RCSAs, residual chem chemical shift anisotropy for the carbons. And the this information, this structural information are very useful. And I think anisotropic NMR parameters um, could also show quite some advantages for the symmetric molecules. So in the following part of my talk, I would like to illustrate uh, for each of this uh, um, scenario, um, I would like to give uh, you an example. So in, in the first uh, example, so here we have uh, yeah, a case where the stereogenic 
center, so sterile centers, they are far apart. Here, I want to illustrate this uh, with a molecule, a natural product called as uh, sacromylylate A. So from the structure formula I'm showing you here, you can see that this is a molecule have five uh, sterile centers, one, two, and 16, and here's nine and 10. And there are two uh, domains, one is here, and the other one is here, nine, 10, and they are separated by several bonds. So this makes actually the de uh, determination of the relative configuration uh, quite challenging and um, based using the conventional NMR techniques. So um, maybe uh, some words about the sacromidylate A. This is a natural product of, that was isolated from a soft coral. And this molecule has a pretty interesting and unique uh, tricyclic uh, uh, hexa decaying core. So since here we have five uh, sterile centers, therefore here we have 16 possible relative configurations. And so first what we have done is we have sampled the conformation of each relative configuration using a combination of molecular mechanics-based calculation and DF DFT optimizations. And um, here we've, at the end, we found that we could obtain the um, meaningful structure for 10 relative configurations. Um, and then we have been also using the J-couplings to reduce the conformation of possibility, which makes our, our um, uh, uh, following analysis uh, a little bit more easier and more straightforward. So, and then in the last step, we have then been using the uh, measured um, um, proton carbon one bounded RDC data to fit against each possible relative configuration. So the results, um, I think you can see it here. So you, you see that only one relative configuration has very low Q factor. So the, the, um, the SSR, SR one, this is, uh, yeah, this is a difference uh, compared to the other configuration. I think you can see it's pretty clear. So, and um, from the RDDC analysis, we have also uh, determined a main conformer of this molecule in the solution. And here, um, from this for this conformer, we actually expect uh, two uh, long-range NOEs, which we could also detect here in the nosy spectrum. And then we have also been using this conformer to uh, predict the ECD spectra for both enantiomers as you can see here in uh, red and green. And by comparison of the experimental and calculated ECD spectra, we were able to determine the absolute configuration of this molecule. And here I would like to mention that afterwards, our collaborator, they were also able to solve an X-ray structure of a um, structurally homologue molecule, which is called as sacromilatoil A. So here for this molecule, so we don't have this, uh, this uh, three and six membered ring. So therefore here, there are only two sterile centers, uh, but this uh, um, is uh, exactly the same sterile chemistry as the sacromilylate A. So here we think that using this, we could actually also very nicely confirm the absolute configuration that we have determined for the sacromilylate A. So um, this is the first example that I want to show you here. And now I'm coming to the second one. Here I'm coming to structurally flexible molecules. So I want to illustrate this uh, with the molecule which is called as fibrosterol sulfate A. Um, this is a molecule with, this is a disteroid. So, and uh, with a atypical side chain, and you see that this uh, steroids, they are uh, connected by a flexible linker. Um, and this flexible link linker actually makes a determination of the relative configuration quite challenging. So in order to yeah, tackle this uh, flexibility issue, so first uh, we decided to use an uh, explicit uh, solvent MD simulation to sample the conformations and their population for each possible stereo isomer. So we have eight stereo isomers, so we did the same thing eight times. And um, then we didn't use the entire unbiased MD simulation to um, get the conformational ensemble, but here rather we have used uh, the um, isotropic NMR data, the NOE and J coupling to select the conformational ensemble. So and practically what we did is we calculated the J and, uh, coupling violation and NOE violation after a certain time step here in the MD simulation. And then we only selected a part of the trajectory, which shows we're good, so it shows the lowest J-coupling and NOE violations. And then we did a confirmational clustering 
where we then we get this uh, conformational ensemble. And then if you look at this uh, uh, conformational ensemble that we obtained, uh, so we found that the shape of the conformers are actually quite different. So um, there, if we, so here, when we, if we assume this, uh, all these conformers have the same alignment tensor, it's apparently not appropriate. So here we decided to calculate for each conformation um, its own alignment tensor. And this case was only possible because here we have a, actually a pretty large set of the RDC data. We have measured 44 RDCs here, and this was therefore possible to calculate the tensor individually. And for this multi-tensor approach, we actually also need to know the conformer population beforehand. And uh, yeah, but this was uh, uh, luckily already computed uh, previously by the MD simulations. So, and then here in this figure, um, you can see the results. So here we also co uh, consider the arrow. So did some uh, bootstrapping analysis, but also by considering the arrow bar here. So only the one configuration shows very significantly lowest Q factor compared to the other one. So where we can here safely assign the relative configuration of these two centers to be SSS. Yeah, okay, I hope that using this example, so I can show you, demonstrate that our anisotropic NMR parameter is powerful for also for solving flexible molecules. Now I'm coming to the third scenario, so where we have this proton deficient molecules. So one of the example that I want to talk about is the spiral epicosin A. Um, this is a new natural natu marine natural product that was isolated from a deep sea derived fungus. So um, yeah, the planar structure of this molecule could be established by two dimensional NMR experiments. And if you look at the structure, you can see that this molecule has uh, two non-protonated -pro uh, stereocenters on this uh, six membered ring. And this uh, made uh, the determination of the relative configuration using NOEs and J-coupling quite difficult. And since here we have two um, non-protonated carbons as still centers, so here we were thinking whether we can also acquire some uh, additional anisotropic NMR parameters, for example, certain Cs, and we thought that this may, might be useful also to unambiguously determine the relative configuration of these two still centers. So therefore, here we have, along this project, we have also proposed a method to uh, measure the residual chemical shift anisotropy using uh, the alignment medium uh, code as AAKLBFF. This is an uh, oligopeptide um, that is able to form nanotubes in the methanol. So, um, so when we work with this alignment medium, we found a very striking feature of this medium. So this medium um, forms a very small, so at the early stage, so at the first few days, so this nanotube is very small. So and um, after about seven days, uh, so this uh, formation becomes uh, completed, then where we have a mature narrow tube, so this uh, narrow tube become much longer and also thicker. And uh, this is reflected actually in the, by monitoring the, of the deuterium splitting. So at the first days, we have a pretty small alignment, so where we have these uh, smaller tubes, and uh, after a few days, this uh, splitting becomes larger. So, and here we were thinking whether we can use this proper, uh, um, using this property to actually measure the residual chemical shifts and isotropy, because here actually, so the entire chemical environment was not changing, but only the alignment degree were not changing so much, but only, I mean, mostly it's the alignment degree was increasing during the time. So therefore we were thinking maybe, maybe we can use this property to uh, extract the delta delta RCSAs. So here, by choosing a proper reference, you can see that uh, with the time, we indeed see a constant shift in the chemical shifts, um, as you see it here. And this is the largest one for carbonous and also for the aromatic carbons, which actually are expected. So, and using this method, we um, measure the RCSAs for this uh, spiral epicotin A and also the RDCs. And we have used the both data sets to, to, to try to fit to the two possible configurations of the spiral epicontin A. So here, um, the results, what we obtained, showed that both RDC and RCSAs, um, yeah, shows that the RR configuration is the correct one. And, uh, and uh, very luckily, um, our collaborator later, they could also, yeah, uh, solve the crystal structure of this molecule 
and here we and our the our determined relative configuration could be also confirmed uh, by this uh, X-ray um, data. And what I found very nice is that uh, the crystal structure actually, when we compare these two structure, we found that the crystal structure actually corresponds to one of the main conformers that we have determined uh, for the two R two prime R by using the delta delta SSA and RDC data. Um, yeah, for this case, uh, maybe some of you may say that, oh, okay, so RDC alone actually is already able to uh, determine the correct uh, relative configuration and is maybe even more discriminative for this uh, uh, correct configuration compared to the Delta Delta RCSA. Um, yes, I agree, this is indeed the case. But um, here, therefore, I want to show you another example where, um, yeah, it was different. So this is the molecule, it's a test compound, it's a known natural product called a spilobalite. So this is a proton deficient molecule with three out of six stereocenters being non-protonated carbons. So for this molecule, we measured seven RDCs and 11 RCSAs. And uh, here in this uh, data results here, I hope you can see that if we use only the RDC to fit to this uh, all the possible configurations, so the correct configuration actually does not have the lowest Q factor. Um, but if we use the RCSAs and here in the fitting, so the correct, this is the, this discrimination is very uh, significant. So the correct configuration SSR, SRR shows apparently a very low Q factor while the others not. So here, I think this is a nice example to demonstrate for some of the proton deficient molecules. So yeah, you, yeah, it is actually quite, maybe quite good to have additional anisotropic NMR parameter like RCSAs. Now I'm coming to the last uh, case uh, for the symmetric molecules. And I want to illustrate here uh, with an example um, with a natural product called as a visual Ocon A. Um, this is also a new natural product um, isolated from soft coral. Here, our collaborators, they were able to so, um, isolate two um, yeah, homolog molecules, and uh, they differ actually only uh, with their orientation of these two carbonyls. So one we call as head to tail, so which these two carbonyls are in the opposite direction, and head to head is that they are in the same direction. So um, the constitution, so the planar structure of, the, of, the, uh, of one um, monomer, this was able to determine by the 2D NMR correlation. But since the, each of this monomer, I mean, two monomer give rise the same NMR signal here in the spectrum. So it was very difficult actually to, to distinguish these two configuration uh, co constitutions just based on the 2D NMR correlation. So it was not possible. But what we found is that the chemical shift difference between the C2 and C3 here at this dimerization pro, uh, positions they are quite discriminative for Wajo Ocon A and B. So one has a very small chemical shift difference, while the other one has a larger chemical shift difference. So therefore, here we decided then also to compute the chemical shifts. And this was done by DFT GL method. And here we have used two different functional. So here you see that the method are actually from these different functionals are quite similar. And here the head to head. Um, constitution show also very smaller chemical shift difference and well the other one shows larger so you based on this comparison we could safely assign the constitution of these two molecules and after that so we also want to determine the relative an absolute configuration of this uh, dimeric position so on, on this dimerization position c2 and c3 and so for that, we measure the RDC and delta delta RCSA data. And then we fit it uh, again um, yeah, to the each possible relative configuration. So here, um, this, this plot just show you that we have chosen different referencing atoms to extract the RCSAs. But at the end, we found that the results are quite similar. And here, so both RDC and RCSA shows that as RSR. So here, this. Um, configuration uh, has the lowest Q factor, and uh, and th therefore we assign this relative configuration as a correct one for this uh, Vijo Okun A. And this result was also supported by the calculation um, based on the isotropic chemical shifts. So using the DP4 
and uh, tp4 plus and the k3d method so um what i also want to stress out here is that we have calculated the angle between the uh, chemical shift as between these two tensors one tensor is the tensor from the rdc and the other one is from rcsa so ideally they should be the same and here you see that we get the uh, very smaller tensor here right and this actually also indicates that the rcsa measurements that we have propo proposed uh, using this aak of avff is kind of quite accurate yeah okay so with that i'm already coming again to this uh, final um yeah slide so yeah I just this, this is again the conclusion I hope uh, using the examples that I have chosen from our studies so I can convince you that anisotropic animal parameters they can be quite useful in this following four cases that I have already been talking about yeah and uh, with that I want to acknowledge give my acknowledgement so most of the work that I've shown you today was done by my students Xiao Luli with some help from Dr. Sun Huan Huan and Peter Schmieder from our institute. Um, the fibrosterol sulfate A was a molecule that I was working on when I was a PhD student. Therefore, here I want to thank my PhD supervisor, Christian Griesinger, who also gave me continued support afterwards. And I want to thank all of our collaborators from China, Professor Xin Xiang Lei, Professor Bingui Wang, Professor Yue Wei Gao, and of course also Amando Navajo Vatskritz. Um, yeah from Brazil for lots of help on the calculation side and uh, yeah thank you for your attention thank you Han uh, nice talk um, so we will move on to the next speaker that is uh, Thomas Williamson thank you uh, Roberto and thanks everyone for joining us today I um, I had full faith that um, Han and, and Philippe are going to share some really lovely applications with us today. So I decided to take a, a bit of a different turn and uh, talk about maybe some practical th things that we encounter when we are acquiring uh, these types of uh, anisotropic NMR data. Um, obviously, there are some things that are quite different than our typical uh, isotropic uh, data acquisition and and uh, thought I would share a few things that we encounter. I call this the pitfalls and headaches in the acquisition and analysis of anisotropic NMR data. And I numbered this number one as uh, lock shim problems in aggregation and, and number one in that if people like talking about this kind of thing, then maybe there will be a number two. And and if not, maybe this will be uh, number one and done. So we'll see how this goes. And, and uh, please um, uh, the intention here is to sort of transition this technical presentation into a panel discussion. So hopefully people have uh, uh, plenty of comments and questions uh, afterwards. So one of the things that, that we often encounter, and as I sat down with one of my uh, new students to, uh, to our lab uh, this, just the past couple of weeks, uh, one of the questions that actually came up is, you know, why is it so hard to lock on these compressed gels when we're using these gels, PMMA or polyhema or, or whatever that may be, um, oftentimes we find that it's quite difficult to, to get a uh, sustainable lock or to even find a lock signal sometimes. And, and uh, of course, one of the, the primary causes for this is, you know, just the nature of the gel. Um, we're basically uh, compressing this gel and, and compressing these interstitial spaces. And, and so from the very get-go, we're basically expelling the solvent that we're using to lock on uh, and the solvent containing our, our analyte of interest, we're expelling that solvent from, from the gel. And so as we compress it, we actually um, basically um, are pushing the gel out of, of the, or pushing the solvent out of the gel, which you know obviously reduces the magnitude of our lock signal and uh, causes a few problems right to start with. We also find that as we compress this gel, we're, we're basically dividing up our lock signal that's present into to several different um, signals. So first of all, we have our isotropic signal, which of course is, is uh, attenuated uh, significantly because basically we're, we're, we're turning our isotropic uh, media to an anisotropic media. And then as, as Philippe so, uh, so elegantly articulated earlier, we, we have our quadrupolar coupling and, and uh, by compressing these gels and creating this anisotropic environment, now we've taken that anisotropic uh, deuterium signal, that anisotropic lock signal, um, and, and basically split that by the, the quadrupolar coupling, which is 
um, um, proportional to the amount of compression or anisotropic environment that we've created. And so what happens is not only have we reduced our overall lock signal by uh, expelling the solvent from, from our, our gel, but now we've actually divided this signal into to three parts with the most minor part being our actual isotropic, uh, uh, residual isotropic signal. So um, what can we do about this and, and how can we manage to, to lock on this and, and keep a sustainable lock throughout our experiments? Well, there's a few little tricks that um, Roberto has shared with me and, and I'm sure that and many of you have uh, have, have uh, um, encountered along the way as well. And so this is just gives you an example of, of what that actual lock signal looks like. So in the top here, we actually have our, our 1D deuterium spectrum. You see our quadrupolar splitting and our isotropic CDCL3 uh, peak. And and uh, and uh, at the bottom, we actually see what this looks like in, in our actual lock signal. And it's a little bit difficult to see. I apologize for that. But you can see that that our lock signal, um, just as we expect, is split by that same quadrupolar coupling. We have the residual isotropic signal, but the isotropic signal is really not strong enough to, to maintain and, and uh, establish a, a decent lock. So one of the first things that we need to do is to, to shift our field, shift our lock frequency over and lock on one of the actual uh, um, uh, resonances of the uh, split doublet, the quadrupolar coupled uh, deuterium. And one can actually manually do this and manually lock. You can just move your field over, scoot it over, turn your, your lock off as, as you adjust it and then turn it back on to, to um, establish the lock. But um, if you're going to be doing these types of experiments more, uh, more than once, then it's a good idea to go ahead and just create a new lock. And in this case, this is a nice slide that Roberto shared with me some time ago, where you just create a new um, solvent. In this case, we just call it PMMA. And uh, basically, um, you, you set it to uh, uh, identify and lock on one of the, um, the, the resonance for the, the quadrupolar um, split um, doublet, um, the deuterium signal. And in this case, we normally choose the, the downfield um, um, part of the doublet. And uh, it's also a good idea to, to bump your um, lock power up by, by about twofold, and that'll actually help a lot in uh, allowing the instrument to actually locate this lock signal, account for the, the attenuated um, deuterium signal and uh, be able to establish a decent lock. So the next problem that we often encounter once we finally do get this lock um, established is that uh, for one thing, our shim for our uh, um, actual um, uh, anisotropic media is gonna normally be quite far off from, from our standard isotropic uh, optimum. And so what we often find is that even though we are able to lock on our signal, we find that the lock signal is relatively weak. And if we acquire um, a uh, 1D NMR signal, even of a, um, a barely compressed um, sample, we'll find that the, the line shape in our, in our proton and deuterium spectra normally looks pretty horrific. And uh, so this can, can lead to a problem. And, and one of the questions that students often ask is, you know, why exactly is this um, um, shim so bad? Why is it so far off? And, and I think that this was illustrated beautifully in a, in a, a publication with uh, Roberto and Armando and, and uh, some others um, a few years back where they did this really nice imaging study of, uh, of uh, an actual uh, gel, uh, um, in this case, a PMMA gel, and showed that actually what happens when we compress this gel is that we, uh, we actually buckle the gel. We don't, um, as you can see here in, in, in C, we don't actually compress the gel in a nice uniform fashion. It actually buckles the gel as we start um, compacting the interstitial spaces in this, this polymeric gel. And what this does is, is actually gives us the total opposite of what we want in a shim. As, as everyone in, in this uh, workshop knows, um, uh, shimming is a process that is carried out to correct inhomogeneities in the applied magnetic field during a nuclear magnetic resonance experiment. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to create a, a extremely inhomogeneous field and, uh, and then use our shims to correct it so that we can get some reasonable line shape. Um, we also have the, the problem that uh, typically relaxation is faster in these anisotropic conditions. Our, our lines are broader. 
And uh, as, as we'll learn later, we can also encounter other issues that may uh, affect this line shape. But the first thing that we have to correct is this shim. And, and I think this is just beautiful uh, illustration of how we expect to see these uh, gels uh, buckle. So fortunately, um, we have gradient shimming. And if our if shim's not too far off, then, uh, then and, and our compression is not too high, then generally we can actually come up with a, a reasonably uh, good shim just using top spin. And or I'm sorry, using a, a top shim in a top spin if you're using a Bruker spectrometer or uh, any other gradient shimming routine, depending on if you're using a, a, a former Agilent or GEOL or, or Q1 uh, spectrometer. And so um, fortunately, gradient shim is, is really an amazing uh, technological marvel uh, for those of us who uh, started out shimming magnets manually all the time. And, and in cases where it works, it's, it's really great. The problem is that it may often uh, be so far off that, that even top shim and doing a 1D deuterium shim may not be enough to actually pull that shim into some reasonable state where it can actually optimize it. And so if you ever do get actual good shims on your anisotropic media, I highly recommend saving those shims so that you can recall those the next time so that you actually have a reasonable starting point for uh, this uh, gradient optimization. If our shim is actually quite far out, then what we'll often notice is that we need to do some um, some some old school tricks where we actually shim on our FID. And uh, uh, oftentimes you can just shim on your lock signal, especially with the um, uh, uh, Z and Z square shims. But um, 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 when we uh, when we start looking at any higher order shims, then almost certainly we need to try to focus our uh, acquisition on a, on a single um, singlet if possible. And, uh, and try to optimize the, the shape and the, the length of the decay of our FID. And um, I'm sure many of you have enjoyed the, the blogs coming out of the University of Ottawa, and, and we really appreciate uh, Glenn's contribution to the NMR community. These uh, uh, blogs are, are really great. And if you haven't ever checked them out, then I, I highly, recommend, highly recommend that you do so. And he has a really nice um, blog here talking about shimming without a lock signal. In this case, we can have a lock signal but, but basically the procedure is the same. We want to basically optimize this FID um, um, with uh, um, 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 just monitoring of the actual um, FID itself. And, and uh, um, it's actually not so hard to do once you get a little practice. And it's usually good to get that practice before you have that critical sample dropped in the magnet and, and uh, are freaking out because you can't get a decent shim. So um, a couple of little hints there that, that can help out. Another thing that we've noticed, and, and not on all spectrometers, but on some of our spectrometers, uh, we noticed that whenever we'd set up these um, experiments um, to run for, for uh, long periods of time, then we would actually note a, a significant, significant deterioration in lock signal. And, and oftentimes on, on some of our instrumentation, we'd actually find that, that we were unable to sustain lock for more than a couple of hours. And basically, we just lose lock altogether. And and if we recall, we're we're um, in a sense sort of uh, hanging on by a thread to 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 establish this lock and and to optimize our shim. And uh, we're we're doing this analysis in a in a very inhomogeneous media to begin with. And so it's amazing that it actually works. And we certainly want to thank all of our our uh, instrument manufacturers and developers for actually making this even possible. So I think that's a that's a miracle in its own right. But um, what we do see is that sometimes this lock level can can actually, uh, in a sense, get beaten down and, and uh, um, we can actually lose it. And uh, once you lose lock, of course, then then everything uh, uh, goes awry and uh, we basically have a failed experiment. Um, the experiment that we often use or most often use to measure our RDCs in particular is this uh, J Resolve Bird HSQC, a, a version of the experiment that uh, Theo Perella uh, published in uh, 2017 or so, and uh, also published a number of other variants. Some other groups uh, um, with uh, um, um, from from Europe also published uh, um, analogous experiments um, targeted more for for biomolecular NMR in in uh, water solvents. So most of those uh, sequences incorporated water suppression, but the same idea where you have basically a a 2D J resolve. HSQC with the bird element to help decouple some of the, the homonuclear couplings and, and uh, help with your, your isotope editing. So um, this is an example of what those data look like. This is on a four milligram of 
sample of uh, quinine we just acquired the other day. And you can see why we like it. We can easily identify our isotropic peaks and and uh, if you adjust your your compression just right in PMMA or almost always with uh, DMSO and, and polyhema, then we can basically uh, monitor our isotropic and anisotropic uh, resonances um, in the same uh, media at the same time. So acquire those data um, um, simultaneously um, in the same sample. And so this makes it really convenient and easy for the identification of our resonances of interest and also for the actual practical uh, measurement where we're subtracting the uh, isotropic uh, J coupling value from our anisotropic value to get our actual RDC. Now, of course, one of the things that have been incorporated into this sequence is, is what I consider to be one of the, the, the biggest breakthroughs in NMR in a very long time and, and certainly a very genius um, um, leveraging of the fact that our homonuclear coupling is going to evolve uh, much slower than our chemical shift. And, and uh, um, Gareth Morris's group and, and uh, all of those uh, folks over there just came up with this just gorgeous um, 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 application that allows us to uh, homo decouple our, our protons in our HSQC data. And this bird-based um, homo decoupling sequence is, is just really beautiful. It allows us to do homo decoupling in real time. But one of the things that you'll note here is that in these chunks, we normally do about eight chunks per acquisition, um, we actually have quite a few pulse field gradients. And so we've already got four or five gradients in our normal HSQC segment of the sequence. And then when we actually add these chunks, we're adding eight times four. Um, so we're adding uh, quite a few chunks of, uh, um, um, of pulse field gradients along with the rest of the actual uh, sequence. And this is just a snapshot of the uh, Bruker's representation of the J resolved bird HSQC uh, acquired in a pure shift manner. And uh, ultimately, what you can see here is that um, in, in the end of uh, eight chunks of a uh, homo decoupling, we've actually applied 37 pulse field gradients for each and every scan in this experiment. So you can imagine that, you know, with this uh, um, dephasing of our lock signal, um, 37 times within the duration of a single scan, you can imagine how that could be somewhat uh, detrimental to the uh, uh, maintaining our lock signal. And as you can see here, this is just after two hours of acquisition on, on, on one of our instruments, you can see how our lock signal is really uh, uh, about to fade away and uh, um, basically the experiment is about to fail. And so we actually came up with a solution for this, or actually we didn't come up with the solution, we applied the solution um, it actually came from a very uh, somewhat unlikely source. And, and uh, um, if any of you saw, were able to see uh, Dr. Zhao Wang's uh, presentation at the New Jersey ACS NMR topical group the other day, um, you'll know about or would have heard about this new uh, so-called IHMBC or isotope HMBC that allows, uh, allows us to um, um, uh, discriminate two bond and three bond HMBC correlations uh, based on their uh, uh, isotope shift of the of the uh, respective two bond or three bond response, and uh, uh, this paper was uh, recently accepted to Nature Communications, and and uh, I uh, saw a little preview of it, and and uh, it's just uh, magnificent work, and uh, um, I highly recommend that that you take a look at it. I'm sure you'll be hearing about it in a future Ivan meeting as well. But one of the things that this group also noted during their uh, long acquisitions. Um, to acquire the data they needed to, to do this um, a highly digitized, detailed analysis of, of these NMR data um, was that um, they would also see a, um, um, a degradation in line shape of their um, actual NMR data with, with long acquisitions and basically uh, concluded that, um, as we, I guess, all know, is that um, whenever we use unbalanced gradient pulses in our, in our pulse sequences, we're using these to select desired coherence transfer pathways. And when these sort of net gradients for the overall experiment is not neat, not zero, which normally it's not because we're we're actually uh, acquiring or using gradients to select magnetization of, of uh, nuclei with different magnetogyric ratios. Um, ultimately, at the end of that sequence, this, these uh, um, 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 lock signal is actually not fully refocused. And so basically what happens is during the FID period, the, the lock system is going to drift in frequency some, and 
And uh, this can actually uh, um, cause problems. And, and uh, as we saw here, eventually um, degrade our lock signal or uh, um, if you don't lose lock, it can still uh, um, create problems with your actual line shape in the experiment. And it turns out there's actually a simple solution to this. We can just turn our lock off during acquisition and then basically during our relaxation delay, flip it back on. And in this way, the correction um, by this drift is ignored and uh, using a set of simple commands, at least in Bruker, it's just uh, lock H on, lock, lock H off. Um, we can actually turn this lock hold on or off. And uh, basically that's going to uh, solve our problem. And so you can see when we incorporate these changes into our experiment, we basically see no degradation in our lock signal even after uh, two days of acquisition. So uh, a beautiful, elegant, simple solution. Those are the kinds that I like, easy to implement. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to share uh, my experiences, but, uh, but that really worked great for us and, and uh, has saved us a lot of uh, uh, pain since instituting these changes to, uh, to our pulse sequence. So another thing that often comes up is, is the question of, you know, why is my Q factor so high? I, I, I prepared these samples just like uh, I read and, and uh, talked to my colleagues about. And, and at the ultimate end of the day, I, I got this Q factor that just really seems awful high and didn't really allow us to discriminate um, the, the relative configuration or constitution or whatever we were trying to do with our NMR experiments. And, and sometimes this can you know, be uh, tracked back to our original conformational sampling. So whether we're doing RDCs or CSAs, we're normally doing some kind of conformational search. So we need to be very thorough and comprehensive in that search. And if we're using RCSAs, then we have to calculate the NMR chemical shift shielding tensors. And so if we have some, some issues there with the choice of functional or, or basis set, um, we can run into problems and, and uh, that'll affect our results with our RCSA. But one of the more common problems that we've actually run into a few times, and for the most part, it wasn't too much of a problem, but it can be a, a real uh, hindrance to getting uh, usable data from uh, these anisotropic measurements, and that is actually aggregation. So I'm sure many folks that are working in the biomolecular field are, are more than uh, um, familiar with uh, aggregation and some of the headaches that it can cause, but we can actually run into problems with um, small molecules too. And even in going back to uh, um, the original um, RCSA paper um, that, that I was fortunate enough to be a part of working with just an amazing team of uh, scientists. Um, even then, um, we actually ran across this problem with, uh, um, the, with aggregation. It turns out that, that one of our, our molecules of interest that we were using as, as a model compound uh, was uh, estrone. And, and estrone turns out is really not all that soluble uh, in chloroform, despite the fact that it looks like it's extremely nonpolar and would just um, dissolve in a flash, it's actually not that soluble. And oftentimes we'd even have to add maybe a drop of DMSO or something to get it solubilized in that solvent. And what we noted was that in, in this original paper, and, and this is basically just a verbatim, what we said is it is uh, um, estrone has very low solubility in chloroform, and it is tempting to speculate that estrone may form aggregates through nonspecific interactions. And what clued us on to this is that we actually saw a rather peculiar alignment um, uh, tensor in, in this molecule, uh, totally unexpected. And if you can imagine um, in a compressed gel, as, as we show here on the, on the left, um, with estrone, we expected its alignment to be uh, more or less um, aligned with the way that we compress these. these Gels, and that it would be uh, um, uh, perpendicular to, to our applied magnetic field. And in fact, what we saw was that our alignment um, um, tensor from our, our SVD fit is actually the total opposite. We're actually seeing it more or less parallel with that, that magnetic field. And, and in our stretch gels, um, we actually um, observed the total opposite. We expected to see it aligned along that mag applied field. And, and in fact, it was more or less perpendicular. And so um, we, we guessed that something must be going on, but the, the fact was that we got really great results, got nice Q factors and, and everything else worked out. And so we sort of assumed that probably what was going on is that we were getting some sort of aggregation, but at least in this case, it was nonspecific and more or less random. And so our SVD analysis of our RDC and RCS data our CSA data um, remain valid. Um, following this work, uh, uh, Neil Amoli Nath and, and uh, his coworker basically um, um, repeated this work um, in 
a polyhema gel, so dissolved in DMSO. And in that case, they actually found that the expected alignment uh, tensor was uh, uh, was uh, conserved and uh, uh, sort of um, um, corroborated our, our suspicion that the original um, anomalous uh, fit was actually from uh, from the fact that that there was some sort of uh, unspecified aggregation going on. So in a way, we kind of dodged a bullet there because had these uh, interactions been more specific, then they could have actually um, really led us astray and, and 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 led us to believe that this RCSA method, all this nonsense that we've been talking, uh, wouldn't have worked anyway. So we were certainly relieved that uh, that this actually uh, did did work out for us. More recently, we were looking into the discrimination of a number of different Sincona alkaloids. And, and in that case, we actually found that uh, that things weren't so rosy and that, that we could actually run into uh, to issues with any sorts of, sort of ag aggregation. And uh, what we found was that whenever we would do any analysis on any of these uh, uh, alkaloids, we'd find that our, our Q factors were, were actually astoundingly high uh, compared to what we expected. We were able to model these these monomers, and, you know, just beautifully. And it's not like that that these structures aren't known, and a lot like a lot of work hasn't already been done on their their conformational space. So we felt pretty confident that we could, you know, basically describe these molecules in solution without too much trouble. But one of the things that we didn't really um, account for in the beginning was the fact that they're also known to dimerize through pi pi interactions of that quinoline ring. And you can see here. Um, on the on the right hand side of this slide, I've actually omitted the quinucleidine ring for for clarity. You can see how this quinoline ring actually uh, stacks on top of itself with the, the the nitrogens of that those ring system actually opposing each other. And so basically, what we're observing is a weighted average of the uh, monomer and the dimer for for the um, um, all of our NMR parameters. And if we actually plot this association, this self-association of these molecules using some uh, uh, really nice uh, um, presentation provided by uh, Misha Rebark from Merck. Uh, you can see that at the, the high concentrations where we did the original analysis, we were at about 274 uh, millimolar just for convenience. It turns out that this molecule is more than 50% dimer. And uh, uh, obviously that would lead to some um, problem whenever we're trying to, to match those RDC um, or RCSA values to uh, to what we'd expect for a monomer. And even if we drop down to 27.4 millimolar, which is only uh, around four milligrams of a sample in a, in a 400 uh, microliter um, uh, solution, what we find is that that even in that state, we're, we're around 15, 16% uh, dimer. And uh, so even at those relatively low concentrations, we're still experiencing um, um, significant self-association. And the way this basically um, uh, reveals itself in these data, is, as you can see here, where we actually took um, some of the RCSA, I mean, RDC data for, uh, for quinine at the two different concentrations. Uh, um, if you look here on the, the left, that represents our, our more concentrated um, data in blue and our less concentrated data in uh, uh, orange, I guess it is. Um, you can see that we just normalized all of these RDC values um, to the to the largest value, which was for H17. And what you can see is that we see very distinctive differences um, and disparities in the, the values of these RDC, uh, measured RDC values. And, and of course, you can imagine if we're trying to, to take these two sets of disparate data um, and match those to the same sets of conformers, um, then things aren't going to work out so well. And uh, this is just kind of a preliminary report, but but I'll just show you here exactly what happens when we use a single tensor uh, SVD fitting, uh, you, where we're actually fitting the population of, of 12 monomer conformers. You can see that at the lower concentration, we are fortunate enough to get a reasonable Q factor of about 0 0.07. So that's, that's pretty good. And especially knowing that we've got about 15% of the self-associated monomer um, in there. So the dimeric species is, is around 15, 16%. But you can see here at the higher concentrations, our Q factor completely blows up. It's around 0.231. So over, over three times worse than, than at the lower uh, uh, concentration. And so, uh, so I think that this is a, a real sort of cautionary tale that whenever we're um, in encountering some, some Q factors or some, some behaviors of our molecules that don't, especially those that don't seem to be particularly solu soluble, 
or even those that do like quinine that that do have some uh, propensity to to self associate. We have to be really careful and uh, really pay attention to what we're actually fitting here. Of course, we could go through and do all of the modeling of the dimer, and I'm sure we can eventually get this to to work out. But if one was trying to just use this as a tool to establish relative configuration or something, then then uh, it would represent a, a huge challenge. And so with that, I'll stop. Maybe we can have a little discussion. I just want to thank a few people, of course, Roberto Gill, for uh, not only uh, inviting me here today, but also uh, uh, inadvertently or, or unknowingly uh, providing some of the slides that I shared with you today. Um, also, I want to thank you, Zulu, uh, formerly for Merck, now with Pfizer, who really got us into this uh, anisotropic NMR business. Gary Martin, of course, for ongoing support and collaboration. Of course, uh, Misha, Ike. Uh, Ryan and uh, Bart, who actually uh, came up with the idea of uh, uh, solving this lock problem for uh, um, uh, these, these dephase gradients. And then uh, Caitlin Aggie, of course, the newest addition to our group at UNCW, which really got me thinking about some of these uh, practical issues that we can encounter um, in the lab on an everyday basis. And we normally, you know, get our data and we go and do our analysis and, and forget about all the things that we overcame on the way and just report the good parts. But thought it'd be kind of neat to share some of the other things. And then, of course, I want to thank all of you for sticking with us all this time. Uh, today and then the Ivan NMR users group for uh, for uh, um, organizing this and uh, and making this a, a great contribution to the NMR community. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Roberto. And if <laughs> folks have questions, then um, I feel well, sure that th thank you, uh, Phil, uh, Han, uh, Thomas, for such a f I don't know, fantastic talks and uh, and also new stuff. So um, yeah, we can probably open for a discussion. If you want, um, you know, write question in the chat or just ask, and then you know, um, uh, raise your hand and and we we will answer. But the discussion is open. May I start a, a question to uh, Philip? Roberto, yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay. I'm just wondering, I mean, um, I mean uh, Philip showed that this uh, polyacetylene showed a higher enantiomer discrimination compared to the PBLG. I mean, I'm wondering, in his opinion, what is the reason for that? Mm, that is a very good question. Uh, maybe because uh, there are many interactions that are, are involved in the enantiomer discrimination mechanism. So it's uh, very difficult to have a rationale. And uh, probably the fact that uh, we have um, for the uh, LMSP or, or um, PLA, the two uh, polyacetylene polymer, the fact that we have a chirality induced by the double bond of the backbone and uh, that can be uh, in combination with the uh, chirality of the side chain. It could be. Uh, I got I, I got a comment about that because that's something that I've seen a long time ago. So um, Christina Thiele was evaluating PBLG versus PELG and you have a benzyl group in the, in the, in the helix and then you have an ethyl group. And, um, and it seems that the, the shorter the chain, the side chain, the more is the discrimination. Why? The explanation is that you get, the compounds can get closer to the, chi, the main chiral part of the, of the polymer, the helix. So, and something that probably now, but no, people don't pay attention or it's, it's old, uh, PMLG that is not soluble in chloroform. It was used as a filter in the old times to filter and, and discriminate and separate enantiomers. So, uh, so PML, th th all these PXLG were used um, long, long time ago for, for separate enantiomers. So technically, the closer the company gets to the chain, to the, to the, the backbone, the more the discrimination. Yeah, Roberto, I would also think the same, but I mean, uh, the PBLG has a shorter side chain compared to uh, polyacetylene. Um, so it's the uh, opposite observation. A, well, but, but yeah, 
that's another thing yeah but the, the discrimination here is based on 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 anisotropic nmr parameters so mm -hmm. uh, if it is just a, a chiral discrimination based on the side chains i think that normally the discrimination on an isotropic nmr parameter is based on a macro chirality you know it's the whole helix mm -hmm. that okay well, that's my view but you're right you're right uh we got a chat yeah, Let me see if we got any questions here it is clear that the, the, the main interaction for the discrimination is the interaction with uh, the side chain. And uh, we have demonstrated uh, this uh, in a recent paper using proton STD experiment. And we have shown that uh, we have a strong interaction between uh, uh, two uh, enantiomers and the, uh, the uh, aromatic part of the PBLG uh, in particular. So uh, what is in, interesting to understand here is that it's, uh, the, the conformational di dynamic of the side chain is very complex in PBLG, in PCBL, and PLA. And uh, this aspect of the things has never been uh, uh, investigated to uh, understand uh, the, the, the discrimination. But uh, we can imagine that uh, when the, the, the side chain is, uh, is long, um, the, the, as I say, Roberto, uh, that the analyte can go very inside between the interspace uh, between two uh, side chain. And it could be uh, another explanation, but there are many, many parameters. And so it's very difficult to have uh, um, uh, uh, a, a rationale of uh, the effect. Uh, and the mechanism uh, leading to the enantio discrimination. This is a real, real challenge. Um, we have 52 people here still. Nobody had a question? Oh, silence. You can, you can unmute yourself. I've been asked a question. Oh, wow. Guys, you, you you told everything, so nobody has questions. Everybody understood. Thomas, it's fun. It's funny what you talk about. You know the the lock, because yeah. in fact I was concerned about the gels. One thing that I want comment that I want to add is that these gels that we made that we've been making, especially Leandro, were making those gels are very you know very homogeneous. So for PMMA, I was swelling. Then I, I gave I gave that talk in, in one of the smash, I think it was in Philadelphia. So we swell them in chloroform with 1% of TMS. And then we do we do a, we do a, you know proton shimming there and you know the, the gradient shimming and it works very nice. But a it's not the gel, is the is the gradients <laughs> during the acquisition for the pure shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is killing. It's amazing. You know, I'm impressed. I'm impressed by, by that, and I'm impressed by the um, uh, the aggregation problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that we uh, um, didn't have any more specific reactions or interactions when we were doing that original RCSA work. I feel like it would have led us astray. I got a question for you uh, because uh, um, when, when I've been studying long time, ago, those are unpublished results, but um, we did the, the conformational analysis of um, a, a quinine. And quinine, uh, the problem with quinine is that there's no way to fit with a single tensor. And probably because of aggregation, because doing NOEs, and there is also another work before uh, uh, done with an analog, that um, it has uh, three major conformations, quinine. In, and these three major conformation, the shape is totally different. Probably they have different alignment tensors. And um, um, my my impression was that that you cannot do a single tensor approximation. But now you show you saw you know you show uh, data that uh, when it is diluted with a Q factor of zero point zero seven. Yeah, that was pretty good, right? It was better than I was expecting. In fact, I, was, yeah, I went back still, and did it a few times. I was like, wow, that was awful loaded. I do something wrong. <laughs> and, and and you did it with single tens. You, 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 did, with, mm -hmm. you did it with all the conformation. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really amazing. Yeah, I was I was I was pretty shocked too. And when I actually go down even lower concentration and see see what those data look like. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Luciano. A quick question to Roberto. Uh, this is a poly 
for acrylomorphine gel. Yes. Sometimes, because it's also worked in, it makes some organic aqueous or any. Uh, we did, we tried only we try only water. Uh, yeah, but, you know this is there is there is a there is a funny story behind this. When I was working with um, Kathleen Farley from Pfizer, and they were using this for they were using PMMA and and polyhema for peptides. Kathleen was asking for a water gel, and I said, but but I've been working to find gels, you know, for organic solvents. And said, why don't you use um, just any other um, uh, water compatible uh, medium used for proteins? And then Kathleen said, no, I want the gel because I want to recover the sample and, I, I, and it was easy to compress. Finally, we figured it out. We found that out, but, uh, but we didn't try with mixtures. So, well, we, we tried with water. I don't know if, if Kathleen is there, if she did something additional with other solvents. I can say that I actually have, have played around a, a bit with those gels. And I found that, at least in my experience with acetonitrile, um, the gels would get very stiff. And you can get a very small quadrupolar coupling, but I don't think it's enough alignment to, to be of use. Now with DMSO, it's a different story. They actually become quite soft and more, even more compressible. And so I think that there's a possibility that um, that that strategy may work uh, better. But with the CDNI trial, we didn't have much luck. Well, that, that you, yeah, yeah. I I forgot that you've been trying those gels, uh, Thomas. Mm -hmm. You got samples. You can have some interesting interactions with uh, when you're mixing solvents with gels. I've had something. So I personally think that the quadrupolar coupling has to do with the thickness of the gel, not so the softness. So the amount that they swell uh, ends up effectuating the quadrupolar coupling. Um, and something I found one time was I mixed two solvents. I forgot what it was and I forgot what gel it was, uh, but it ended up swelling much larger than usual when using each individual solvent. So you can come across some unforeseen interactions or, or uh, what is it called? Unforeseen results. Right, right. And we'd love to do a really nice systematic <laughs> study, but I'm, I'm holding on to the few gels that I've gotten. <laughs> I'm protecting them with my life. <laughs> well, if you need some more, just get in touch with me. I still have some. Okay. Thanks, Leandro. Uh, the, the other thing that you had, the other thing that you had to keep in mind is that you, you saw the gels don't compress, the gels buckle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so if the gel, the gel swells too much, there is no room in between the wall of the tube and the gel. So you can, it cannot buckle. So, mm -hmm. so tuning, the problem is that tuning a gel for compression is more difficult than using a gel for stretching. Because for a stretching, you put it in the, in the flexible tool and you stretch it. But in order to really compress the gel, you have to have the right amount of space between the wall and the gel. That, that's, that's the key problem. But as Leandro said, and also when you swell them outside this polymer, they swell in a different way. Some swell fatter than, 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 than taller, some are thinner than, 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 than on the sides. So the shapes that they can adopt depends on the composition of the gel. Well, anyone? Had any comments? Uh, ju ju just a comment about uh, the problem of lock. Uh, even in uh, the PBLG mesophase, uh, even if the sample is very uniform, very homogeneous, after uh, a long period, uh, the, the lock uh, is lost by the, 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 the NMR spectrometer, by the lock system. And uh, what uh, what else? Whatever the uh, the the um, the, uh, the component of the quadrupolar doublet of the chloroform we use the right the right or the left uh, component, and it's it's a, it was a very interesting problem. But uh, uh, we don't find a solution to uh, to keep the the lock uh, very stable. Uh, for an experiment uh, over uh, 10 hours, for instance. Uh, and uh, it, it's a real problem even for a classical mesophase as a lyotropic uh, system. I don't imagine uh, what's happened with uh, compressed or, or stretched gel, which is uh, induced uh, 
uh, many uh, uh, problem in, in the phase and so for the lock also. Well, the, the, the quadrupolar coupling for the MSOL is only five, six hertz. So you can even yeah. use the gradient shimming and, and no problem because the, the top shim is it doesn't detect that the inhomogeneity by that split. You know, it doesn't really detect that split field. Uh, so I, I don't, I didn't see it. I didn't see much. I didn't see any problem, especially when shimming the gels with these with chloroform, uh, with a TM, with TMS in chloroform. But okay, I had to recognize that I didn't use this experiment for the longer time, you know, and with more sensitive instruments, you know, you don't need that. And, and I didn't, uh, and I didn't play much with the pure shift because that's the other thing. I, I weigh too many, too many, uh, um, 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 what's called gradient pulses during the acquisition. So that's a very smart, you know, solution. Um, uh, well, I don't know. But I don't think they are the gels. My the gels are my baby, so I don't think are the gels. It's the, are, the, <laughs> are the freaking gradients? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 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 only one question from the from the uh, from the audience. Okay, and they st we still have forty seven people here. So. Yeah, we, we can keep discussing within the panel, but uh, you know, guys, stimulate the discussion by questions. Well, you are the boss, Chris. You can say you can close the meeting. Uh, okay. Uh -oh. There's one. There's there's one from Luciano. Yeah, okay. okay. In his talk, I, I I'm not so familiar with this field. How does one do the high sensitive detection? Because he mentioned something doing the TNMR uh, quadrupole spreadings and uh, uh, nice abundance. What's oh, the principle of detection? That's for Philip. Yeah, for Philip. Uh, uh, I did not understand very well because the sound is, was not so good. Uh, it's the question of how to detect the signal and how you detect natural abundance, the theorem. How? Yes. Uh, just uh, <laughs> accumulating sangler. No, we, we, we try to optimize the amount of, uh, uh, of solute in the polypeptide. And uh, the best way is to recording spectrum at high field and uh, uh, using a cryogenic uh, NMR probe because uh, we have a, a huge uh, and a significant increasing of the sensitivity. And uh, this is uh, very important for for natural products because uh, the molecular weight of such uh, analyte is very is very high, and so uh, we uh, we need to have uh, matter in in the in the probe to uh, and sensitivity of the experiment to get uh, uh, reliable uh, data to be that can be exploited for uh, uh, structural analysis for instance or measurement of enantiomeric uh, uh, excess well there, there is no log the experiment is done with with, with regular solvent any contamination of the uterated solvent it ruined the experiment i spent a yes, week with, i spent a week with field there and we use a syringe to measure the uterated methanol and, and and then we left the syringe and it dry and we forgot and we use it again and we contaminated, you yeah. know, with, with deuterium the um, our sample by using that syringe that was dry. So uh, and also keep in mind in that at that time because I was there we we used fifty milligrams fifty milligrams of uh, artemisinin and seventy milligrams of um, strengthening on that PBLG in order to get that data. So it's, it, we were like people in the old times trying to run inadequate. Yeah, exactly. So we might expect with the progress of the new cryo probe and uh, the, the, the increasing of the magnetic field uh, strengths that uh, we can uh, access to uh, a compound with higher molecular weight and or a smaller amount of uh, available uh, compound. So the next the next adventure, well, our NMR spectrometer and the cryoprobe will be coming back uh, 
Uh, and uh, we, we have uh, many uh, new molecules to investigate and to see the limits of the technique when we are using uh, RQC uh, recorded at the natural abundance deuterium NMR. Wait and see. There was a question, there's a question or comment by Robert in the chat box. Um, Robert, if you are still there, unmute and you can ask or comment on that. Yeah, I was just commenting that it, it seemed uh, reminiscent when we were talking about the uh, the RCSA signal arising from interactions of the analyte with the uh, with the chiral gel. It seemed kind of similar to a challenge I've you know come across before in chiral separations on and HPLC, and um, you know without delving into like density functional theory, you know maybe just talking qualitatively if. Uh, that would seem to arise from the similar kind of uh, mechanisms with the interactions of the uh, analyte with the with the stationary phase or gel in this case. Any any comments from the panel? Well, um, um, there are two different things uh, because we, we we know all these these uh, chiral uh, the auxiliary chiral agents that they produce a shift. But that shift is an isotropic shift. When yeah. with RCSAs, the RCSA is due to a, an anisotropic change. So, yeah. so what, what normally the, that shift is because when you have your isotropic shift, the isotropic shift is the average of the three, the three values of the tensor. Okay. And, and if they are different, you know, but they have so it is uh, sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three divided by three. And that's the isotropic shift. But when, when you put in, in an alignment medium, the molecule will align. And then the probabilities that was one third, one third, and one third for each of the components of the chemical shift tensor are no longer one third. And, and when, when the, 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 the molecule aligns, then you change those probability. And that shift called RCSA is due to an isotropy that is different from a, a, a chiral you know, auxiliary. They are totally separate things. So I don't think that this is what it is happening in an HPLC column. Now, I, I fully agree with you, Roberto. This is, the mechanism is based on the different of the orientation and the interaction is a, another thing, an important thing, of course, but this is the orientation which is at the origin of the, of the, of the discrimination. So uh, makes a similarity is maybe for me difficult. Um, but I think the basic mechanism is, is kind of still similar. Yeah. I mean, there are still the intramolecular interactions yeah. that these are the di diastereomeric di interactions between those chiral and chiral, uh, chiral um, gels or chiral liquid crystalline phases with those chiral molecules. So the basics of the interactions are still the same. It's just reflecting different sense. The RCSA is not due to, to chemical shift interaction. The no, RCSA is due to order. Orientation, yes. I will give you an example. For example, you, you know, and Philip has done a lot of work on that. You know, you have deuterium, for example. So you have two enantiomers, and then you put those two enantiomers in PBLG. And then you will see that the chemical shift is exactly the same. But when you run the quadrupolar coupling, okay, then you will see one quadrupolar coupling for one enantiomer and another quadrupolar coupling for the other enantiomer. So you don't see anything in chemical shift, but then you see different properties in alignment. And that, and, and that explains that the discrimination is based on orientation. So the, 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 the alignment tensors are different and the orientation are, are different. And that is how the discrimination happens. So for me, the comparison of the RCSA with the, what happened in an HPLC chiral colon is different. That's why I insist that the diastereomorphous interactions that really that really dominate when you use a, a chiral phase is, is the interaction with the backbone. Or what or whatever or whatever thing that has micro my, you need macro chirality. Because this local interaction of chemical shift are not the ones that are happening there. I don't know, Philip. You you have done a lot of work with deuterium and NMR, and then you have seen enantiomer with same chemical shift and different quadrupolar coupling. Okay, you, we can see a, a small effect uh, associated to the deuterium residual chemical shift and isotropy. 
It's very small, of course, because uh, uh, the uh, anisotropy for deuterium is uh, is very small. But we can see some uh, some difference for 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 two enantiomers. But the most important interaction is the residual copolar coupling, of course. So the chemical shift, uh, the deuterium chemical shift isotrope is very very close to the uh, deuterium uh, chemical shift, chemical shift anisotrope. But uh, there are some sometimes some some small small few Hertz, very few Hertz of difference. Well, here there is a, a comment by uh, Karel. Um, are you there? Yeah. Well, you said that you agree with Han. It is a physical chemical interaction, but the measurement of NMR is on the physical system. So, well, the, here the discussion is that the, the RCSAs, you know, the, the RCSA is the, 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 the shift in RCSAs is produced by a change on the probability or the orientation mm -hmm. probability of the chemical shift tensor. Sure. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a shift, but it's not a, like a, it's different from the chiral, chiral auxiliary. That is it, two, it are two separate, two separate effects. Um, I, I, I can't see it. Um, you, you still have to have an interaction between the analyte and the medium. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, those, those, are, those are the things, if we want to calculate a, a structure from RCSA, we have to get rid of the isotropic shift that is the interaction between, between the, your component and the medium. And what, what Han did with that peptide was amazing because it, it, she, saw, she observed that when she put the sample in the peptide, that made the one that made nanotubes, at the beginning, you know, there is no anisotropy, so that is pure mm -hmm. chemical shift, and yeah. the sample is the same. And then, as the as the as the, as the nanotubes are formed, whatever you see is um, is um, is a R pure RCSA. So you can you can subtract because the problem when the problem before what Han did or or, or some other people did is that if you run your sample in a nice isotropic condition, let's say chloroform, and then mm -hmm. you put it in the in the PBLG. Okay, the RCSA is not accurate because the RCSA is RCSA plus isotropic chemical shift due to interaction with the phase. But if you keep it in the same chemical environment, you just subtract it. That's what 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 Ham done with the the nanotubes. Um. And what would you say to that? So, uh, what would Han say to that? So, sorry, I, I don't get it. Uh, uh, could, could Han comment on it, uh, what you just said, please? Oh, yes, she, she, what, you, you, what you have done with the peptides, uh, Han. Um, I, I mean, I, I was still thinking about this interaction. So, I think, yeah, so. It's maybe on the different time scales, Roberto, right? I mean, the NMR, so this different, uh, and I, so different tensor, different orientation that we see with the chiral molecules, with this chiral gels or alignment media, and the H HPLC. I mean, these are just the interactions on the different time scales, I would say. So, I mean, these orientations, these interactions, these are rather very transient. Um, so the, inter the, the time scale is very short. You know, in order so that you 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 still see your NMR signals, um, but in the HVLC, I mean, the interactions are much longer, so they are sitting in the phases. No, well, but 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 in 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 a chiral in a in a chiral HPLC column, the column has no anisotropy at all. There is no. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, it's just the why it shows difference. Yeah, it's of course different mechanism in a way. Okay, I think so. Yeah, so. I understand what you are saying. Yeah, yeah. Roberto. The beta angle, the beta angle is the one that this gives you that they have two different tensors, you know, and yeah, that's just based sure. on order. So so the, the, the HPLC column is not an isotropic. No, no, but when I what I was praising is your work, you know, that 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 you you started you started with this peptide. And then, and then at the beginning, the peptide is the, the chemical shift that you see there is the chemical shift of the compound with the phase. And then, and then as, as the order growth, what you see is pure RCSA. That's genius. 
Uh, th thank you for thank you. Oh no, that. no, I, I, I am impressed by your work. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the <laughs> recognition. Oh yeah, no, we we all we all know about that. With 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 PBLG is the same problem. You know, there is a there is a, a, a work by G. Liu and all the, the the Merck team in which what he was doing is in order to compensate for the isotropic shift. So they were they were make they were making the the, the phase and they were adding PBLG. Okay, and then and then by adding the PLG, they changed the anisotropy, but they didn't significantly contribute to the isotropic shift. That's another another very ingenious uh, way. So, so would you would you say the anisotropy is chiral then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The the, uh, the, the, the these phases, you know, PBLG. P no, 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 not not the phase. The anis anisotropy is that chiral. Yeah, they, well, they depends. Gels are not chiral, but chiral and isotropic medium are PBLG, PELG. So yeah, these yeah. are helical polymers. Yeah, those are chiral. Yes. Yeah, the <laughs> compounds are chiral, but the anisotropy that they create is that chiral. Yes, because the an the the anisotropy is a kind of what I I like to call macro chirality because the whole change as it as in the helix. The mm -hmm. whole helix is like, an, for example, like, uh, you know, D, you know, DNA, you know, something yeah. like that. So, so you, you have a mic, macro chiral environment forming columns, but the, it's, it's like floating columns in solution, creating the anisotropy, but at the same time, one enantiomer and the other enantiomer, because the two enantiomers are, you know, interacting with, let's say, an alpha helix. So then mm -hmm. you create what they call diasteromorphous interaction. And then you yeah. are creating diasteroisomer. So when, I, when enantiomer A goes to the alpha is A alpha, and when enantiomer B goes to is B alpha. So then you create that interaction that is a diasteromorphous interaction. Yeah, so that that's, diasteromorphous. A, that's a physiochemical interaction. And that's yeah. what gives rise to the um, enantio differentiation. Yeah. Well, but this enantio differentiation is, 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 is an isotropic enantio differentiation. It's not based on chemical shift, it's based on an isotropy. So yeah. the, the two enantiomers, they will have two different alignment tensors. But, but the anisotropy comes from the interaction between the analyte and the PPLG. Well, no, because if 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 they interact, you don't you don't want binding. You don't, I, I, you know, normally, normally mm. uh, an isotropy is static, you know, the order. Otherwise, if it interacts and then, then it doesn't have to bind. So it's, 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 it's complex, but but I want I want to make it clear that of two different interactions, mm -hmm. auxiliaries are isotropic. You know, yeah. this, this discrimination is anisotropic and is based on having two different alignment tensors for the two enantiomers. Okay, so the anisotropy is chiral then. Sorry, say again. The, the anisotropy is chiral. Yeah, the anisotropy, yeah. In, in, the case of, in the case of these uh, helical homopolypeptides, the, yeah. also all of the one that makes, you know, like a, like a magma mm -hmm. chirality, yes, they are chiral. But for example, gels are not chiral. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, so there doesn't have to be any physiochemical interaction. No, not really, because normally the normally the, the orientation the orientation or the order is is aesthetic. Because if you start getting you know interaction, that's binding. Mm -hmm. okay. Whatever degree of binding, that's the idea. It's interesting. Yeah. Philippe did a lot because Philippe work all his life with chiral alignment media and I work with a chiral alignment media and Xin Xian Lei with Han Sun they were collaborating making these self-assembled peptides mm -hmm. that they are also chiral. Okay. Or, um, yeah. But we don't see large chiral discrimination there in the no. peptides. Yeah. And right now oh, yeah but I just want to mention that I mean if you look at this polyacetylenes I mean, that uh, Philip was also showing today. I mean, those large discrimination you only you always see well, with those 
alcohols, which has OH bonds. So they need to have some interactions with the backbones forming the hydrogen bonds. Otherwise, if you just have uh, molecules which just uh, don't have OH, hydrogen bonding donors, you don't see large enantiomer discrimination. Well, that interaction has to be weak because uh, uh, it, it because be it, it, it has to be very weak, and 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 we observe, for example, uh, alignment modulated by some interaction that is happening with the the water gel, the poly um, uh, morpholine, because uh, there is some interaction and the, the alignment is strong. There is a, a, a interaction that alignment that is modulating by by mild binding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you look at PELG, that it has an ethyl group, PELG has a much higher beta angle than PBLG. It's something like 9% from PBLG uh, compared to 20 something. You know the numbers, Phil. I, I just don't remember by heart. And I've been reading about these PRLG products from the 80s that they use filters to separate enantiomers. And the, the best separator was PMLG with the methyl group because it was closest to the to the coil. And I made it and I and I put it in solution and it doesn't dissolve. And Tina told me this, Tina Tilly told me the same. So though you cannot do it because that would be fantastic if you have only a methyl group, but they are not solvable. Yeah, but it's very uh, dependent of the analytes that you uh, that you investigate. Yeah. If you have a, a series of very complex molecules and uh, with a various family of analytes, I'm not sure that uh, the result uh, will be always the same. It's very complex, uh, uh, and no. the discussion is is uh, is clearly there. Hydrogen bonding is very interesting and very important uh, interaction for to improve. The uh, to increase the discrimination, but it's not the, the only uh, uh, interaction because if it was the case, we never succeed to discriminate uh, al uh, ap non polar al chiral alkan. Okay, so it means that the, the, the mechanism based on the shape recognition is also very important, and all interactions that we can push the uh, analyte. Close to the polymer, in uh, uh, an important uh, uh, effect to increase the the quality of the discrimination. But the, for me, the main the main mechanism is the shape recognition of the molecule. And so, more the molecule is uh, the shape of the molecule is anisotrope, is anisotropic. More the discrimination will be uh, will be uh, will be uh, 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 important. So it's 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 a it's a combination of uh, uh, shape molecule, uh, shape anisotropy, shape uh, recognition by the, by the polymer of the, the of the enantiomer, and the uh, interaction between the analyte and the polymer, who can improve the the mechanism of the discrimination. It's difficult to make a separation between uh, uh, electrostatic interaction and the shape uh, uh, shape anisotropy of the molecule. The way I visualize this is, you know, you you have an, an, an a, like an a chiral, okay, a rod, okay. So so you you know this is your molecule is coming here. When it comes here, the molecules always adopt the same order. So if the alignment is modulated by those hydrogen bonds, those hydrogen bonds in the gel they have to be in the same way, because in in order to create the anisotropy, you know, the hydrogen bond here has to have it same here and say here, say here respect to the helix. Because if you have the side change and the side change move anisotropically, the interactions are gonna average out. So all the anisotropic NMR parameters average out and then the probability of the, the you know, the tensor or the, the, the probability tensor is gonna be the same. So, so I agree with, 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 with hand that there are, uh, you know, there may be some hydrogen bond interaction, but the interaction has to add up in the same direction in space. For example, you know, there are these organogels. These organogels that are molecules that, that, that they, the, the organogels, they make fibers. These fibers are anisotropic, and someone told me, oh, can we use them? No, because when you, when you make, you know, an image of the fibers, Fibers are in this direction, in all, in all different directions. So, so the fibers are anisotropic, but overall, 
they averaged out the anisotropy. That's my view. If you if you make if you make a gel with the side chain, if you make a gel with the side chain chiral, you don't differentiate anything because the gel is is in all directions. We did that. So there is so discrimination of, of enantiomers by anisotropy is different than the discrimination of enantiomer by a, you know, a chemical shift. Yes, that's indeed, I agree, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know, I don't know, we've been here. We, we got 34 people still very patient. Oh, yeah. I know, I Thank know, you. you still have all the Thank four. you to the survivors, you know, guys, it's amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, you guys, I don't know, you know, feel free to contact us, you know, if you, if it's Han, Thomas, uh, Phil, thank you so much for giving such fantastic talks and anything, you just, just contact us. Th thank you, thank you, Roberto, um, Philip, Han, and, and Thomas. This has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the people will stick around if you guys continue to talk. <laughs> there, is a, there is a good yeah. group here. Um, I just wanted to, in addition to thanking our panelists today, I also want to alert whoever is still there about the ENC, Ivan ENC conference, user conference on Saturday, April uh, 15th. Uh, we have a very interesting set of talks and you can both either attend in person or um, from your home, our office, whatever. And so register, attend. There's a lot of interesting talks and we also have, uh, we are going to be doing a Ivan Founder Award announcement and we have three Ivan hours um, on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday night. Um, so exciting. Uh, ENC conference coming up. And uh, this is actually your uh, group, meaning Ivan group is everybody's participation is very useful. So let me know if you have any particular topic that you would want to um, propose for future uh, Ivan uh, um, workshops, do so. Um, and all the previous Ivan workshops are in YouTube channel. So you should be able to go to Ivan website and uh, watch the previous ones. If you are interested, there was a question about that in the chat. So I just wanted to let people know that they are all available um, in our uh, YouTube channel. With that, I think um, I want to thank everyone. And uh, I just want to add one thing. So in, the, in, the, in my presentation, when I share it at the end, I compile all the material I put there, my webinars, the book chapters, uh, all the review articles from everyone, for all the players that have been working for 23 years on an ISO, on developing this. There are book chapters. Uh, there is also, I put all the reviews article from Phil there, from Philip. So on all this part, there is a totally different feel of this chiral alignment. So you, you know, so I will share that and then you can share that with the attendees. Okay. Thank you. With that, I will close this meeting today.